Well, thank you everyone for coming this evening to learn different ways that you have available to you to fund your MSW, or maybe you're just thinking about an MSW and you're trying to figure out um, if it's feasible. So welcome. Um, if you missed it, any questions you have, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and we will answer them at the end. Um, this is being recorded and we'll send out a recording to folks. So we're gonna go through a lot. Um, so don't worry, you can go back and look at these slides later. So um, my name is Leslie, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I work in the Office of Admissions here at the School of Social Work. Um, and specifically, I do MSW admissions as well as um, scholarships for the whole school. And I will go ahead and pass it to Elisa. Hi, nice to see some familiar faces and names. Um, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Elisa, I use she, they, Shaw pronouns. I'm an MSW uh, year two student and in the clinical social work path. Um, and I'm one of the student information specialists. Thanks, Elisa. So Elisa and I will be taking turns presenting today. And then towards the end of our session, um, we will have three other students join us, Liza, Stephen, and Brielle. Um, and they will join to talk a little bit about how they have funded their degree. Um, but first we will start off with a land and labor acknowledgement. So we just want to acknowledge that UW Seattle campus is situated on the ancestral homeland of the Duwamish people, the first people of Seattle. The University of Washington acknowledges the past, present, and future of the Coast Salish peoples of this land. The land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. We remember that our country is built on the labor of enslaved people who were kidnapped and brought to the U.S. from the African continent and recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We also acknowledge all immigrant labor, including voluntary, involuntary, traffic, force, and undoc undocumented peoples who contributed to the building of the country and continue to serve within our labor force. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. We encourage you all to go beyond acknowledgement into actions of learning and advocacy for these peoples. Thank you, Elisa. So as we begin, just a quick overview of the agenda. We're going to start off talking about tuition, then all the different types of funding, including financial aid, traineeships, fellowships, assistantships, and some select external funding options. Um, we'll go over some funding resources, briefly housing and healthcare info, and then you'll hear from current uh, students how they are funding their degree, and then we'll take questions at the end. So again, we're gonna go pretty fast. Um, so any questions you have, pop them in the Q&A. And like I said, this is recorded, so you can always come back and refer to these slides. So to start off, we'll go ahead and cover tuition. Um, these are the tuition and fees per program, and this is for this current academic year. So every year, the tuition and fees may slightly change. Um, so you'll see that uh, the full-time programs are charged differently than the part-time programs. Um, and once you're a student, your rate is locked in. So you will pay the same amount, the same per credit fee. Um, you'll also notice that in our full-time programs, the tuition is significantly discounted for Washington residents. And this is because full-time programs are state subsidized. So residents get a discount whereas part-time programs are not state subsidized, so there's no discount for residents. Um, and instead, the part-time programs are charged on a per credit basis rather than per quarter tuition. Um, if you're an out-of-state student, uh, full-time and part-time are about the same. Part-time is sometimes slightly cheaper, um, but if you are a resident, the full-time programs are usually much more affordable. Uh, and to establish residency, you'll have you have to have resided in Washington State for 12 months before the first day of the quarter. Um, so if you expect to be a resident by the start of the program, then you can go ahead and apply as a resident. And Elisa will also talk a little bit at the end about her experience um, establishing residency. So briefly, that's tuition. And now we got to figure out how to pay for it, all the different um, funding options. So Big picture, there are three main buckets of funding. 
There are external funding um, options. These are private loans, private scholarships, jobs you might have. Um, and then within UW as an institution, there is financial aid. There are on-campus jobs, fellowships, and assistantships. And then within the School of Social Work, that is the departmental funding. So those are fellowships, assistantships, and traineeships. So we're going to start first with financial aid, which is um, administered by UW as a whole. So um, this is including grants, federal loans, and work study. This is all administered by the UW Office of Student Financial Aid, so not us. So while I'm going to go over some things about financial aid, we are not usually the experts on financial aid. That would be the Office of Student Financial Aid. And to get financial aid, you have to submit the FAFSA or the WASFA. Um, if you are an international student, then you are not eligible for financial aid, unfortunately. Otherwise, if you are um, a Washington resident or a US citizen, um, then you can go ahead and submit the FAFSA or WASFA. Um, and just a disclaimer I always like to give is, what aid you may have gotten as an undergraduate when you were earning your bachelor's degree um, may be a lot more comprehensive than financial aid you would receive as a graduate student. There are a lot more state and federal programs for financial aid for undergraduate students as compared to graduate students. So don't expect the same aid package that you had as an undergrad. Um, most graduate students get exclusively loans. Um, we'll talk a little bit about grants, but for the most part, graduate students in financial aid will really just be getting loans. Okay, let's start off with um, grants. So grants are uh, free money. These aren't loans. This is money that you get um, directly. And uh, it's only for Washington residents in full-time programs. So this means if you're in a part-time program, you would only be eligible for loans. Um, similarly, if you are in a, uh, if you are an out-of-state resident, you are only eligible for loans. But if you are a full-time uh, student who is a Washington resident, you could get up to $12,000 in grants um, through FAFSA or WASFA. So $12,000, definitely helpful, definitely a sizable chunk, but even if you qualify for the maximum amount, um, you still would have to cover um, quite a bit more of the tuition. So like I said, most folks get loans. So loans um, in undergrad, or sorry, not undergrad, in, for graduate studies, um, these are for U.S. citizens, U.S. nationals, and some eligible non-citizens. Um, and these are two types of loans. These are uh, federal direct unsubsidized or federal direct graduate plus loans. And you can get these through FAFSA or WASFA. Although if you are submitting the WASFA and you don't have um, documents, if you are undocumented, then frequently you are not elig eligible to take out federal loans. So a little bit more about the two types of federal loans available to graduate students. Um, they are similar in their interest rates, um, but they're different in the maximum amount you can take out. Um, and so uh, the federal direct unsubsidized loans, you can have a maximum of $20,500 a year, um, whereas the graduate plus loans will give you um, however much you need in cost of attendance minus any other aid you've gotten. Um, one of them has a grace period, so you don't have to begin paying it back until six months after graduating, whereas the direct graduate plus loans do not have that grace period. Um, so... Big picture of loans, like I said, we are not the experts in financial aid, so further questions about that can be directed to the UW Office of Student Financial Aid. Um, I will say though that, like I mentioned, a lot of graduate students fund their studies with loans. And there are several loan forgiveness programs available specifically to social workers. So there's the big one that many of you may know about, which are public service loan forgiveness programs. This is through the federal government, and this is that your loans will be forgiven after 120 payments if you work for a government or nonprofit. And this can apply to many social worker positions. However, there's a few more that are more specialized for social workers. 
there is the National Health Service Corps, and this will repay up to $100,000 in loans um, if you work in a certain location for two to three years. Um, this is for licensed clinical social workers. Similarly, Washington State has its own health core. This will repay up to $75,000 um, for three to five years of service. And then there's the Indian Health Service Loan Repayment Program. And they will pay $25,000 a year towards loan repayment um, if you give two years of service. So some programs to look into if you know that you're going to be taking out lots of loans and looking for a way to pay them off fairly quickly. The other portion of financial aid that's a much smaller portion for graduate students um, is work study. Uh, and so, like I mentioned, it's grants, loans, and work study. Work study is pretty uncommon for graduate students, although some um, do get it. It's an hourly paid job. Um, you work with the UW work study office to find an eligible position, and you work up to 19 hours a week. Um, so least common way of um, getting financial aid, most common is loans, and then some folks get grants. So how to get financial aid? Well, the FAFSA is supposed to open by December 1st. Um, sometimes they will open before then, but cross your fingers, it'll be open by December 1st, as well as the WASFA. Um, the priority deadline for UW to submit is January 15th. This is also our deadline for many of our admissions. Um, so January 15th is a good date to have in your head. Um, in December is a really good time to fill out the FAFSA or WASFA. And then if you are in our advanced standing program, you'll be uh, in school during the summer. And so you have to fill out a separate summer aid application that opens April 1st. So obviously you can get aid through FAFSA or WASFA, um, but another reason to submit this is that it is a common prerequisite for many other types of funding. So in order, for example, to get departmental scholarships, we require that you have submitted the FAFSA or WASFA. So please everyone submit who are who is eligible, um, submit by January 15th, 15th to make sure there's no money left on the table. Um, and uh, this is kind of a brief timeline of when you might hear about financial aid. So you would first get an offer of admission, and then a few weeks later, you would get a financial aid package. Um, and that will be sent via email, um, and you'll typically hear about that by early April. And then you have to actually accept your aid. You can accept all part or some, um, and you have to accept your aid by May 1st, and you can always request changes to your financial aid. Um, and then you would begin uh, school and your aid would begin being deposited to your account. So that was a very quick overview of financial aid. Um, put any questions you have about financial aid in the Q&A, we'll get to it at the end. And then now we're going to move on to another type of funding um, that many of our students take advantage of, and that is our traineeships. So Elisa, take it away. Yes, thank you. Um, so traineeships, many of you probably have heard about this uh, through the grapevine or through me <laughs> or Eliza, um, but basically they're offering a specialized training. So there's Workforce for Student Wellbeing, um, WDI, which we have a student that will be coming on later to talk about it, um, CTAP or Child Welfare Training and Advancement Program. Another student will be talking about that. There's a Latinx Communities Traineeship. And then there's a Carol Lamar uh, Traineeship in Integrative Oncology and Palliative Care. Basically, these are all within the UW School of Social Work. They have specific advisors, they have specific electives, practicums and seminars um, dedicated to these kind of like micro cohorts within our bigger cohort. Um, so here are some of the uh, brief descriptions on traineeships. CTAP is basically just to recruit and develop skilled child welfare social workers. Um, and WDI is to increase diversity of behavioral health practitioners in the state's community health agencies. Workforce for student well-being is to recruit diverse social workers to serve in high-need schools. Latinx communities support future so social workers committed to serving Latinx communities. And the Carol Lamar Fellowship is to support future oncology social workers. And just again, to reiterate, there, these placements also have specific practicums that you would be at. Um, and then next is, so 
uh, you see the little D, I, and U. Um, so what this means is that the D stands for um, the trainingships that are open to documented students. And then I is open to international students and U is open to undocumented students. And this is specifically to these specific traineeships. Um, if you're thinking about practicum, there are over 600 <laughs> practicum sites. Um, so just to keep that in mind. And, uh, oh, and for CTAP, this is for, the eligibility is that um, these are clinical students, which means that your specialization is clinical and you're entering your first, second, or third year, third year meaning EDP students, and then clinical students entering their first year and EDP students entering their second year for the WDI. Um, for workforce or student well-being, specialized students, but incoming day and EDP students can apply to hold a spot. Uh, and then Latinx communities is for specialized students. Um, Carol Lamar is for second year day and third year EDP clinical students. Um, advanced standing students may be eligible with special permission. This just means that um, it basically talks about the application cycle. So some of them, for example, the um, CTAP and WDI, because it's open to clinical students entering their first year, uh, typically there's a application either be before or like around the time you get an acceptance. And they also have their own info sessions. Okay, so what um, the traineeships offer in, for funding is basically this beautiful table that Leslie uh, made. So CTAP, um, the funding is grants covering most or all of in-state tuition in exchange for working in a Washington um, department children's children youth and families for time period equal to the time you receive the grant so this means if you are funding if you're a day uh, day student so that's two years if you um, are requesting for funding to cover both two years then in exchange it would be working for um, dcyf for two years and if it's only for one year so on um, wdi is up to $51,500 for day and EDP students or $25,750 for advanced standing students and grants. And in exchange, it is working in a Washington Community Behavioral Health or Tribal Health Agency for three years. Workforce for Student Wellbeing is up to $30,000 in grants. And in exchange, work in a high needs um, Washington public or tribal school for two years. Latinx Communities is a $5,000 fellowship to one student each year. Um, and there's no postgrad requirements for that one. Carol Lamar, uh, same thing, 5,000 scholarship and no postgrad requirements. Uh, like I said, there's info sessions listed. Uh, I believe these are also listed on our website. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Um, they also, like I said, they have their own advisors and they would be much more equipped to answer any specific questions you might have about the program or the traineeship. Um, so I highly suggest you check them out. Uh, they also have, um, for those tuning in via audio, for CTAP, the info session details are sent to applicants in January and applications are usually due around February, March. WDI, multiple info sessions in December and then submit the application um, via the WDI state portal by March 1st, and then make sure you select UW Seattle. Workforce for Student Wellbeing, many info sessions, submit an application by March 1st. Latinx communities, there's an info session and application details will be sent to admitted advanced standing students. And the Carol Lamar um, info session details will be sent to advanced standing clinical applicants in January and current UW MSW students in winter. And the application opens late winter. Thank you, Eliza. So um, like she mentioned, we'll be having um, some students join us at the end of this who are part of some of these traineeships. Um, about a quarter of our students are part of a traineeship. Um, these are really excellent opportunities to fund all or part of your degree um, and also get specialized training. So definitely something to look into um, as you're looking into all the funding opportunities. Next up, we're going to talk about fellowships. So fellowships are frequently known as scholarships. Um, we frequently call them fellowships just to make it confusing. 
Um, and like other types of aid, there are two big buckets of fellowships. Um, there are departmental fellowships, so ones that the School of Social Work awards. There are also UW fellowships that the school as a whole um, offer. There are also some external, obviously many private scholarships that we'll touch on a little bit at the end. Um, but to talk about departmental scholarships, these are open to everyone. So undocumented students, international students, full-time, part-time. Um, the only requirements are that you submit the FAFSA or WASPA by January 15th. If you're international, this requirement is waived since you aren't able to submit that. And then you must submit the funding consideration form by the application deadline. Um, please, please complete the funding consideration form. I'll show you in a second where you can find that. Um, it is such an easy way to potentially get um, some money. The average award that we give is about $7,500, although some are a little bit more and some are a little bit less. Um, and then UW offers a few different fellowships for graduate students. Most of these you would need to apply for on your own. Um, and some that are the most relevant to our MSW students, um, there's a fellowship in aging, so caring for um, gerontology, uh, social work. There is a fellowship for Latinx scholars. Um, and then there are some that require departmental nomination. And by completing our funding consideration form, you are automatically considered. So to make sure that you um, are considered for departmental funding, you must submit the funding consideration form. After you submit your general MSW application in the portal, this checklist will appear with everything that you have completed and are still awaiting. And this is where you'll see post application questions. This is the funding form. So once you've submitted your application, do not forget to also submit the funding form. Um, you don't wanna leave any money on the table. If there's a possibility to get funding, definitely, definitely do it. Um, it's not very many questions. So be sure to complete those post-application questions to be considered for departmental fellowships. Um, and then a brief timeline of when you might hear about that. Uh, you would get an offer of admission and just like financial aid, you wouldn't hear about fellowships until a few weeks later. Um, then if you are offered a, fun, a fellowship, uh, you'll be sent an email, usually in mid-March. Um, you'll also receive an email if you weren't selected for a fellowship. You'll have until April 15th to accept the award and accept your offer of admission. Um, and then if you are in a program that is two or three years, so our day or part-time programs, then every year you are a student, you'll have an opportunity to apply for fellowships once again. So if you don't get a scholarship this year, um, you may get one your second year. Um, also, if you do not get a fellowship in mid-March after an offer of admission, um, it may still come a few weeks later. This is because as students may decline their offer or their awards, some funds may become available and we reaward those funds. So while the vast majority are awarded in mid-March, there may be a few that are awarded after this. Um, just briefly in terms of like how uh, likely is it that I will get a fellowship? So about 90% of our part-time students receive funding over the course of their MSW. So over the course of their three years with us, 90% will get a fellowship. About 43% of our full-time students receive a fellowship over the course of their MSW. Um, and about 61% of all MSW students will get some sort of fellowship over the course of their MSW. So, this is fellowships or scholarships. Um, we're going to go to the next form of funding, which are assistantships, which Elisa is an expert in. <laughs> yes, assistantships are uh, paid academic employment with tuition benefits. Um, so these are part-time, they're full or partial, partial tuition waivers, stipends, hourly pay and or health insurance, and they're hired based on merit. So the current position I hold is an assistantship uh, and we'll talk more about different positions uh, later. So depart department, so school social work, there's staff assistantships. Staff assistantships just means that you work with um, the school staff. So like an office um, and then for example, my position, I'll be, I'm under the office of admissions. And then under University of Washington, there are other 
assistantships available. So there's teaching, research, um, and other staff assistantships. Uh, and these are open to residents, non-residents, um, documented, and international students. And they're, these are usually around uh, $28 per hour, but it does um, depend on the assistantship. Uh, so like I was saying, there are positions available. As you may know, Liza and I are graduating. So our positions will be open. Um, and then there's also a writing center within the School of Social Work, and all of them are our classmates. So they all, all three positions will be available as well. Um, and then student computer consultants, multiple classmates in there too. And this will be four positions that are available. Um, and applications are usually sent via email to admit students in March. You will know if you got an assistantship by April 15th, which is the decision deadline. Um, and also the writing tutor is only open to students in specialized year. So that means um, if you are in advanced standing, you will be eligible for it. And uh, some situations there may be open, they may open up apps up to incoming um, advanced standing students. Okay, so um, assistantships, like I said, uh, you can, they're usually sent out by email. A, um, a lot of the different departments will be sending them out by email. This also includes like teaching, um, research and staff assistantships within the University of Washington. There's also the Graduate Funding Information Service. This is a whole um, office dedicated to funding graduate students and they have a lot of resources. Um, and then UW hires and UW job and internship platforms, which is Handshake. These are, uh, you need like a UW login. So you might not be able to access it until um, after admins. And here's some terms to look out for, assistantship, assistant, graduate student assistant, GSA, um, which is graduate student assistant, but the acronym, academic student employee or ASC. And assistantships outside um, School of Social Work that MSW students have had before are GC, which is Graduate Student of Equity and Excellence and Leadership Without Borders. Thank you, Elisa. Chat about assistantships. Um, next is on-campus jobs, which Elisa also knows a little bit about. Yes, so um, on-campus jobs are jobs intended to be held by UW students. Uh, these will also, um, I would say work study goes under this too, but there are also specific on-campus, so there's specific work study jobs and then there's specific on-campus jobs. There are maximum 19.5 hours per week during the academic year, different than work study and it's open to international students and they're hired based on merit. These are kind of the jobs that you would probably um, think that are not just academic jobs. So it would be like food service, clerical work, et cetera. Uh, this is also available through um, Handshake. So again, you need to be able to have a UW email and um, net ID to log in. Great. Okay, we're going to briefly cover some external funding opportunities and then we'll hear from some students. So um, briefly, some external funding opportunities are those that are outside scholarships, outside loans, and tuition assistance programs. Um, so for outside scholarships, we do have a section on our web page um, that lists some resources for finding scholarships, as well as specific scholarships that some MSW students have found to be relevant. Um, the earlier you start your search in outside scholarships, the better. Um, they range in amounts and they range in their requirements, so it can be a lot to wade through. So definitely check out the page that we have on our website. Um, to help narrow it down a little bit, you can look based on identities that you hold or fields of interests. Um, so definitely don't discount outside scholarships. Now, in terms of outside loans, um, we would strongly suggest that you only look at outside or private loans after you have borrowed the maximum you can through financial aid loans. Um, this is because interest rates and repayment um, plans are much friendlier um, with federal financial aid. And so really only go to private outside loans if you have to. And note that they are still counted in your financial aid calculation and must be reported to the Office of Financial Aid. Um, UW has a really good article on their page on their financial aid website about um, some things to look for in private loans that are reputable. 
And then finaid.org also has really good guidelines for finding private student loans. And then in terms of outside tuition assistance programs, um, one that I would like to mention is the Department of Veterans Affairs Health Professional Scholarship Program for Mental Health Professionals very long. Um, but you don't have to be a veteran. You don't have to be military uh, affiliated. They will cover 100% of your tuition as well as a living stipend. And you get a guaranteed job in Veterans Affairs afterwards. So if this is something you're interested in, definitely take a look into it. It's a great way to fund your degree. Um, and then another tuition assistance program is the Washington State Employee Tuition Exemption Program. So if you are employed by a Washington State agency and you continue to work for them at least 0.5 FTE while you're in school, you can get about six credits free each quarter. Um, there's some bureaucracy involved in this, and it's only available to those in full-time programs. Um, but if you have questions about that, feel free to email us. We can give you the full detail um, on how to take advantage if you are a Washington State employee. You also obviously can work, um, and Elisa is an expert in working during grad school, so I'll let her take this one. Okay, um, I, we get this question a lot, Liza and I. Uh, can you work during the program? So full-time, advanced standing, Possible to work part-time, but not advice. Uh, uh, my coworker last year was an advanced standing student um, doing an assistantship and part-time advanced standing. There's more flexibility, but it is difficult to work full-time just due to all in all, um, just remember there is practicum, there's courses, uh, lots of reading because it is a graduate program, lots of group projects. Um, and I'll save my idea in, at, until the end. Uh, full-time day program. Uh, first year, many work part-time, just as myself, and then you'll hear from some of my classmates. And then second year, possible to work part-time, but not advised. And then part-time extended degree. First year, most most of them work full-time, but then in the second year, many students often cut back on hours due to them starting their practicum. And then third year, same thing, most students cut back on hours and because the content gets more dense. And this is true in all, everyone in a specialized um, year. In any case, it is my biggest answer is that um, it's up to you as a student to consider the potential impacts on maintaining employment during your graduate graduate studies, given the time constraints of classroom and practicum commitments. Um, there's a lot of group projects. There's a lot of reading. And I just really want to reiterate uh, that you want to be a good classmate as well. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so practicum. Another great question we get is, are practicums paid? Some of them, most of them not. Uh, so it does vary. Um, usually there are like uh, different varieties of practicum payments. So this could be through uh, stipends. So again, like it ranges, it could be hourly positions. Um, it could be like quarterly stipends or for the whole year. Uh, I will say that um, I always like to advise that some of these practicum sites that do pay are very niche or you get employed by the practicum itself as like an on-call. So that's what I did last year and that's how my practicum was paid. Um, but that also meant that I was on-call slash working extra hours outside of practicum. Um, so just keep that in mind. And an agency of employment. So this means using your job as your practicum. Uh, there are a lot of requirements. So U UW uh, School of Social Work has affiliated agencies. Uh, basically, what this means is that they have to fulfill a set of requirements to be able to um, abide by the Council of Social Work Education uh, credentials and competencies. So agency of employment pl uh, placement application, and they need to prove substantive, substantive learning opportunities related to the social work competencies, like I said, and an eligible field supervisor um, or field instructor. So just like the Washington Employee Tuition Exemption Program, the Agency of Employment also has some bureaucracy involved. So if you have specific questions, email us. We can connect you um, with the folks that know all the details. And housing. Um, so there, are, there is UW graduate student housing. I highly suggest you check out the website. It's flexible billing, no first last month's rent to move in, and you can apply April to May. And some of the graduate student housing is like an actual apartment. There's one that's like a re, 
remodeled like historical building, which is really cool. And right behind the School of Social Work, it's called Commodore Duchess. And a lot of our classmates really like it. Um, there's also City of Seattle Affordable Housing, MFTE, which is low income housing. Uh, just to give some background, I've been in an MFTE apartment for like the last couple of years. I will say if you do apply for MFTE, keep in mind, this is income restricted. So if you plan on working, um, there just might be some limitations to that, especially if you're living in a one person household. So please do your research. And in healthcare, there's UW Hall Health and School of Dentistry. They offer short-term support, medical advice, one sub subsidized medical visit per quarter, um, and then insurance for international students and assistantships. And just to point out, if you are an international student, you are required to buy the insurance um, for healthcare. And then there's we also have a school of social work mental health specialists. So this person is in-house. They're really cool. They also graduated from our program and are an instructor. So they really are able to support a lot throughout the whole program. And some resources. Um, I'll pass it to Leslie. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, we're almost done and we get to talk to the students soon. Um, so just some general resources for students um, who need some financial assistance. UW has emergency aid available. Um, there's also a food pantry. They also offer some free legal services for students. Um, there are short-term loans. Um, Leadership Without Borders is great about supporting and finding uh, funding for undocumented students. If you're a student employee, there's a resiliency group you can join. Um, the Graduate Funding Information Service is through UW Libraries and they will work with admitted and current students to find um, funding. And there's also a child care assistance program. So lots of resources at the school as a whole. Um, and uh, if you have a need, UW probably has some office or group that can help support you to figure that out. So. The million dollar question or a couple thousand dollar question, <laughs> is an MSW worth it? Elisa is a current student. Elisa, take it away. Yes. Yeah, so um, also would love if my classmates are able to chime in, if there's time uh, for them to also chime in on this question. But the most important thing is to evaluate your goals. Does an MSW align with your goals? If you have been working in, for a while, you might know that Sometimes degrees don't really need to be that relevant to the position, but sometimes they do need um, your background and experience within a specific degree. Create options for yourself um, and apply to more than one program. Apply to many funding opportunities. You can decide what's best once you see um, where, where you're admitted, financial aid, et cetera. Uh, I know a lot of our prospective students ask a lot of questions prior to applying. But most of the time, I always say just apply first <laughs> and then we can always revisit some of the things we um, talk about. And then also weigh the cost versus value for any MSW program, any graduate program, consider value. Um, so specializations, classes, faculty, practicum, et cetera. Uh, try to avoid a cycle of debt. I'm sure um, if you relate to this, not many people are born into generational wealth. So we really have to be uh considerate and thoughtful about our decisions, especially long-term decisions that uh, affect our finances like this. So kind of why I chose an MSW, um, the job growth. So there's a 10% growth through 2023 versus 3% for all others, uh, all, all other occupations. MSWs, um, oh, and 10 to 20% growth for healthcare, medical, mental health, and substance abuse social work positions. There are many social workers in many settings of all kinds. Um, and I also want to suggest if you are able to try to look for um, social work positions or and under different like keywords like case manager, et cetera, um, and you'll find them everywhere. Just a tidbit. <laughs> uh, and uh, higher pay, especially in the Pacific Northwest. So MSWs make 36% more, and Washington has the highest MSW salary, ranging from $80,000 to $95,000. Uh, in the Seattle metro area, salaries are 44% higher than the national average. Throughout the U.S., social workers make nearly 20% more than the average American. And then there's many resources that we're going to put in the chat, but it's a versatile degree, and it is required for licensure. Great. 
Thank you, Eliza, for helping me out with all of that. And thank you to everyone for sitting through all of that content. Um, as you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. And we now get to hear from our fabulous students who can share a little bit about their um, specific ways that they are funding their degree. So I will go ahead and pin Riel, Stephen, and Lisa, as well as Eliza um, for us. And um, Elisa, since you were just talking, I'll give you a little bit of a break. Lisa, if you wanted to begin sharing your experiences, um, please do. Yeah, thank you, Leslie. Hi, everyone. I'm Liza. I use she, her pronouns. I am an international student, and I am also a coworker of Elisa. Um, so I am currently doing the graduate student assistantship as a student information specialist working at the so School of Social Work's admissions office. This is one of the great opportunity for international students to apply for this position. Um, I would say as an international student in the in grad school and in social work, um, the opportunities for getting funding is definitely limited. So we really need to try to utilize all the resources um, and really try to use your navigating ability as a future social worker to help find things that will work for us. Um, usually this will be on-campus jobs, uh, which we mentioned in the earlier sa uh, sa slide. And I will also suggest um, people looking for CIRCLE, which is Center for International Relations and Cultural Leadership Exchange. That's at UW, they offer a lot of really great resources on navigating financial resources. So if you just put in UW Circle in Google search bar, you will be able to lend to that page. Um, and I'll also put links, oh, thank you. Um, the link is in a chat uh, by Elisa. Um, and I also have advising sessions open um, through our website, through the Connect With Us. If you are an international student and want to discuss more about um, looking for resources, you're welcome to book an appointment with me and we can do some navigation together. Um, yes, I think that is all from me. Um, oh, also the school will keep sending out a lot of scholarships um, like kind of sessions for people to explore resources and also info sessions. I would recommend going to all of those sessions just to find if there are um, scholarships open to international students. There are a few, but they exist. Um, so I will save the time and pass on to my other, uh, my other cohort friends to introduce their funding resources. Thank you. Um, Brielle, would you like to go next? Sure, happy to. Hi, I'm Brielle. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I am currently a CTAP student and in my second year, and I've used CTAP funding for both years. Um, and since I'm a Washington resident, it covers all of tuition and all of my fees and everything. It looks a little different for non-residents. Um, so for applying to CTAP, the process can seem really overwhelming. It's something I knew I wanted to do for a really long time because I've been in like the foster care world for quite a few years working. Um, but even then approaching the application, it just looks more stressful than it needs to be. Um, and I would say if you have any questions about the process to always reach out because the field instructors and advisors are super nice and very friendly. Um, and now I have really great relationships with a lot of them and they're really happy to answer a lot of those questions. And when I first got my contract after applying, it was really stressful to like read through it and the wording can be kind of intimidating just because it's a very like legally binding document because of the amount of like financial assistance that they offer. So I would just say, ask as many questions as you can. I don't know if I'm allowed to tell you this, but during the interview process, at the end, they give you an essay. So be prepared at, after they ask you all the questions to like have 30 minutes to write a response essay um, because I was shocked by that. And then pros and cons of being in CTAP. I would say I'll start with cons because I like to end on a high note. Um, it's definitely a direct track to child welfare and you're spending all of your time in child welfare. So I would say some amount of interest in that would be helpful, but I would also say that there are definitely students 
that I'm currently in the program with that just plan to finish their employment contract and then move on to something else. And I could also see myself doing that after a few years of working at the department. Um, something to note is it is funded by the federal government. So bureaucracy is definitely a part of the process and the program. And then there's also a potential that funding can vary or change by the quarter, but four quarters of funding in and everything has been fully covered for me. Um, it's two years in the same internship placement. So some people don't like that um, as opposed to like other people in our cohort, they get to choose usually two different placements and kind of get two different experiences. So you are in the same placement the whole time, um, but they do move you from CPS, Child Protective Services, and then you move to more like case management, child welfare and family services. So that's nice. Um, there are some required courses or limitations to certain electives that you're not allowed to take. Um, not allowed to, as in funding won't be covered for those things. However, if you take it on top of your course load, like I did last year, then it's just included in the funding and that's totally fine. And I think Eliza already mentioned you are kind of stuck on the clinical track. So you would want to be interested in getting that as your specialization. Um, and then some people like this, some people don't. I would say there's less direct responsibility than some of my colleagues in their internships. Some of them have like their own caseload of 10 people. I don't have any of my own cases, but I am working side by side with a caseworker and like assisting on a lot of her cases. So that looks a little bit different than some other internships. But there's also lots of pros. I would say it's extremely flexible and I have an amazing field instructor that is really respectful of my time and work and life balance and like always encouraging me to flex my hours if I have to stay late or telling me like just to say no if it's outside of what I'm able to do. Um, there's a lot of academic and professional support that other internships don't necessarily have capacity for because we have our own staff that are CTAP staff. We get to go to a conference this year they're flying us to Spokane and like paying for us to stay at a hotel and you do have to present at the conference but it's kind of a fun experience that other internships might not have and then there's lots of seminars and trainings and opportunities for like professional development which is really great you get the chance to interact with a lot of current students and employees so we have like a little mini cohort inside of our um, two-year cohort for the day program and then a lot of employees at DCYF are currently in the extended day program. So I've gotten to network with a lot of other CTAP students and kind of hear about their experiences. They've helped me through like class projects and different things that I've had questions about, which is great. Um, and you get a really good in-depth experience with CPS and with case management and really understanding the process of child welfare because that touches a lot of other parts of social work. So it's a really good base to have as you move into the work. Um, for me, since I'm a two year day program, I will only have an 18 month employment contract, um, but your buyback period doesn't start until graduation. So I might choose to get hired early, but I won't be able to start that contract until June when I graduate this year. Um, and I would say the biggest pro and why I chose to do it is you just get so much experience with children, families, parents, service providers, family members, like you see so much, you interact with the court structure, and I think a lot of these skills and things apply to so many other settings. So I'm hoping to move on to maybe hospital or school social work later. And I've talked to a lot of people that can like attest to how you're just able to move really smoothly to those other roles after experiencing what you do in this kind of like crisis and like high stress work. Tips and tricks for being interested in CTAP, I would say, know that the interview process is a little bit slow and sometimes communication can be frustrating so it was hard for me when i was applying because they make you commit to uw like that deadline is before ctap gives you an answer on whether or not you got accepted and will be getting funding but you are able to email uw and let them know like i'm waiting for a response from ctap so i don't want to pay 250 dollars until i know that was my situation I wasn't able to commit until I knew I had the funding to do school. So I would just put a little plug in there that you don't have to make that decision unless you're ready. Um, and then you can also apply to other scholarships and receive other financial aid on top of what CTAP gives you. And that's something I didn't know before starting the program. They told us like partway through the first year that that would just be deposited into your bank account. So this year I was able to apply for additional scholarships and get a little bit of like, I don't know, income, I guess, on top of the tuition assistance, which is really helpful. 
And then working at DCYF does come with some pros. It's a really good starting wage and benefits package compared to some of the other starting salaries. And they have started a licensure program that is just getting up and running. So when you would graduate, you would have the opportunity to get free um, supervision and support for the exam to get your license if you're looking to do that after having your MSW. And that's all I have for now. <laughs> Thank you, Brielle. Even I learned some stuff from that. So thank you so much. Um, and I will pass it over to Stephen to talk about WDI. What's up, y'all? Mine is not going to be as intensively, like, very well-informed presentation that Brielle did, but I can definitely do one. Um, yeah, I guess I'm not going to really do an overview, but, you know, WDI is the Washington State Behavioral Health Workforce Development in Initiative, and it's basically to get social workers into community head behavioral health, uh, community mental health, um, because of the behavioral health Washington crisis in Washington, um, which doesn't really exist because behavioral health crisis doesn't actually mean anything. It's just poverty, but it's just like how we validate putting more money um, and grant money into these projects. But I digress. Why I chose WDI is because I needed money um, and I needed to get out of my job that gave me less money than I needed. And so I applied to it. Um, and preparing for the WDI, it was pretty easy. Um, it's really not that much. Um, it's not that competitive because they actually want you to work in these systems. So if you need the money and you don't want to deal with having to pay for tuition, I would definitely do it. Uh, just know what you're getting yourself into in community mental health and you are prepared for that. Um, to give you an example, I have a caseload, not big, but of eight. I think two have psychosis, two have schizophrenia. Um, they all have PTSD, all of major depressive disorders. Um, and it's great. I really like it. It's fun. But if you're not used to that um, or don't feel like you want to do that, I would be cautious and maybe just research of what things you'd want to do. Um, you are hired um, interviewing for these practicums too. Um, and you know, you have 130 people in your cohort and 20 plus people in your WDI cohort as well, right? Who has that money. So you're gonna be going on for the same practicums. Most of them are gonna be unpaid. Um, so you'll be, yeah, in it for a while after three years. Um, of your ed program, right? Um, and I think that's with all EDI day program. I think advanced, stand advanced standing has two years after that you have to fulfill. Um, but other than that, yeah, I gave you all the cons. The pros is you get money, which is great. You get licensure after two years. The whole funding is 51K. So if you're out of state, it's not, a not gonna cover your, your uh, tuition. If you're international, you need like a work authorization after your education visa expires anyway. So I don't know. That probably is pretty challenging to do. I don't know if more information on that, but I know that's the process. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I got. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so Stephen and Brielle can answer some questions um, in the chat if you guys have about CTAP and WDI. And while they do that, Elisa, do you want to chat with us about assistantships, residency, all that. Everything. Um, yes. If you have the emojis, please give them a round of applause. And thank you so much for taking out the time to come tonight and talk to everyone. Um, so assistantships, like I said, Liza and I are in this position. Um, there was an advanced standing student last year, my coworker, who, and also was on the first slide, shout out to Grace. Um, <laughs> who was in this position last year. Uh, I will say they're very, very competitive. Um, if Liza wants to talk about the process since uh, she recently onboarded, but they are very competitive. They're just like jobs. So you would have to uh, apply for it, um, get invited for an interview and then wait um, a little bit for decisions, et cetera. Uh, I also am a research assistant. Um, these are some paid positions, but again, this is another extra like workload. Some of them have requirements. Some of them are flexible. It just depends on who's your research team. Um, and I'll say 
more on that later, but uh, establishing residency. So what I did was I actually moved to Seattle a year before I started to apply for the program. Um, this was just like perfect timing for me. I had a previous position that, able, that was able to transfer me to Seattle for one year. Um, so there was that. Uh, and I was really lucky to be able to do that. Um, I will say if you are establishing residency, I know someone had mentioned it and we can answer it again later, but um, you you have to do it before you um, the before the start of the program that you're applying for. So our programs start in September, but if you're an advanced standing, you would have to, uh, that would be July. So you would probably have to be here in June, like up to June. Y'all can read it. Um, I'll put the residency affidavit. But um, also, uh, this is a question in the chat that you cannot switch from non-resident to resident um, because also, if you think about it, that would apply to everyone. And it, uh, that means that tuition would change for everyone. Um, so in order to establish residency, the residency affidavit is only um, before you start the program. Uh, and it also has to be for um, a non-school related. So you can't move to Seattle and then take courses. Uh, it could be like you were working a job, um, but just keep that in mind. That's also one of the requirements. Uh, supplemental in income. I talked about this last year, but I dog sit, I plant sit, <laughs> I try to help out when I can. Um, I also substitute teach. So there are a lot of opportunities in Seattle, which is really lucky. I know a lot of my classmates also work um, in the restaurant industry and hospitality industry. So that typically those are a little bit more flexible. Um, I will say I don't work as much this year uh, just because of our practicum requirements and also just like our much heavier workload. And like I said, I'm on the research team now. Uh, and then I'll, thus leads me to the last point. I took out a loan, a very micro loan. Um, so any good uh, or any a good piece of advice that I've gotten is to only take out a loan that you are absolutely required, like needing. Don't take out more than you need to unless you want to slash need to. Um, but for me, I only took out, I believe like 6,000 or something along lines um, and it's distributed over the whole year. And it was only for this year. Uh, and they, so it's about like, 2000 extra per quarter because we operate on a quarter system. Um, and that was a way for me to just supplement um, my living expenses without having to work so much um, in my supplemental income or other positions. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's pretty much all I have. <laughs> that's a lot. Thank you, Elisa. Um, so it is seven. So understand if you have to leave. Um, this is also where I will go ahead and plug that if you have any questions, you can email us, you can follow us on Instagram. Um, you can book an advising appointment with Eliza or Eliza. Um, there's lots of ways to get in touch with us. Uh, Steven gave their email in the chat if you want to reach out to Steven about WDI. Um, I will go ahead and stay after to answer all of the Q&As, um, but I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording since I know sometimes people share things in the Q&As that might be a little bit more um, personal.